is if we open up Trezor Suite, we can actually see that these two devices show up as a Trezor T and a Trezor One. We can also use it with Exodus. They both show up in Sparrow, Electrum, MetaMask, and just about anything else Trezor compatible that you can try. So in this video, I'm gonna be doing an unboxing setup and review of the OneKey Classic as well as the OneKey Touch. These OneKey devices are interesting in that they are essentially running a modified version of the Trezor firmware. So the features that the two devices provide are very similar. So I'll just be covering them both in one video. And the real question that I wanna have a look at is, you know, as far as Trezor clones go, you know, are they any good? And uh, let's just have a look and see. And if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe. That way you can stay in the loop for content I make to help you find your way in the crazy and often hostile environment that is cryptocurrency. These are the two devices. Let's have a look at what's inside. So the classic. This is everything we get. Comes with a bunch of paperwork, including uh, this excellent warning right on top. Comes with three recovery sheets and a little thing to put them in. Again, with a nice warning there. A USB-C to USB-C cable. And this is the device itself. And just for reference, for size, you know, we can see it next to a uh, Ledger and a Trezor. It's actually similar in size to a credit card, you know, just like this cool wallet here, uh, but obviously not nearly as thin. There we go. I guess the standard sort of Trezor startup screen. So we'll just say English. Right, so we can create a new seed, we can restore a seed, we can see about and, oh, what do we got in settings? Bluetooth, language, auto lock, shutdown. So the wallet creation process on the OneKey Classic is similar to the Trezor One, but it also has a few key improvements. Firstly, it actually forces you to back up the seed uh, when you are creating the wallet. It does verify some of the wallet words and it also uh, forces you to set a pin. Never mind the fact that all of these things, so pin, passphrase, uh, wallet creation, everything, all happens on the device itself and let's have a look at what comes with the one key touch. Okay, and this is what we get with the one key touch. It's got exactly the same sort of pile of paperwork that came with the classic three recovery sheets, a USB-C to USB-C cable, and this is the one key touch device itself. And just like the uh, classic, we can see that it is a pretty small device, sort of going for about the credit card size roughly in the same sort of category as a Ledger or a Trezor in terms of size. So this is definitely uh, built differently to a Trezor, it's gone with a metal case uh, and a large touch screen. So let's just power it on. Okay, here we go. So, and look, let's just do create new wallet just to see what that looks like on here. So just like we saw with the OneKey Classic, the OneKey Touch follows and improves on the Trezor process. Not only does it force you to set a pin, uh, but it also forces you to do a full seed backup and verifies all 12 words as opposed to only verifying part of it. So it doesn't actually support Slip39, so if that's a feature you want to use, that is important to know. All right, so I've looked at the sort of on-device setup and I just wanted to run through the vendor-supplied software. So not only do they have uh, support for mobile platforms, both iOS and Android, but they've also got wallet software for desktop, for browser, as well as some bridge software. And this bridge software here is actually also useful if you're going to flash your own firmware. So we'll come back to that later. But anyway, I'll just run the uh, standard Windows one. And basically once we've got that installed, we just run through the process of connecting our hardware wallets. There we go, it's found both devices, so I'll just do both of them. And there we go. So this is basically the OneKey wallet software. So we've got both hardware devices there. Essentially we can change, you know, which uh, cryptocurrency we want to use. So we can switch to Bitcoin, for example. We can also add as many accounts as we like for these, which is nice. And one of the things you'll quickly notice is that these devices actually have a much wider coin support than their Trezor counterparts that they are based on. And really for this sort of stuff, your best bet is just to jump onto their website. You can see straight away that not only does the touch support way more than the Trezor T, but even the Mini and the Classic, uh, which are essentially running modified Trezor One software, support a much wider range of things than what you would find on the Trezor. And just like we saw with the improved wallet creation process, it should be really obvious now that this is not simply a copy paste job in terms of the firmware, but the OneKey team are actually uh, starting to add some significant feature improvements to the Trezor based firmware that is running on these devices. The vendor supplied software is also quite feature rich in that it includes all the sort of market based things that people often look for. Um, pretty much all of the swapping and cross train bridging stuff that you might want, a bunch of NFT stuff for folk who like that sort of thing, as well as a bunch of DeFi stuff. We can also see we've got the standard sorts of settings, 
as well as some more advanced and frankly privacy centric stuff that actually allows you to choose which nodes the vendor supplied software uses, including being able to add custom ones. The other handy thing that I noticed actually is the account screen also includes useful tools and these will change depending on which coin you're using. So for Bitcoin, it'll do things like take you to a block explorer. Uh, whereas if we switch this to Ethereum, for example, we can actually see that there are tools built in to be able to view the uh, contract approvals that we might have there for our account. And to top things off, the uh, mobile version of their wallet has pretty much all the same features, at least that I can see, uh, in there. And this is actually running on an iPhone and connecting to these devices via Bluetooth. We can go in, so we want to add a hardware wallet, and it will basically just find them via Bluetooth. And you can see it's found them both just there. And basically, once we've added the device, we can just hit receive, and the workflow is pretty much identical to what we saw on the desktop. Done. And the thing's a bit surprising to me is that often with these sort of new players into the market, the vendor supply software they provide often isn't very good. You know, it's often missing a lot of features. Whereas what OneKey are offering here is pretty much on a par with what Ledger are offering in terms of having, you know, full desktop support, full mobile support, as well as open source options to boot. Now, if we move beyond the vendor supplied software, the other really interesting thing is if we open up Trezor Suite, uh, we can actually see that these two devices basically show up as a Trezor T and a Trezor One and they pretty much work exactly like a Trezor. So we can just go into Trezor Suite, we can say show full address, and uh, we'll see the Bitcoin address on here. And that just works exactly like a Trezor T. The one warning I will give you is that it actually will let you flash Trezor firmware onto the device. However, it will not work. So I definitely suggest don't try this. You may very well brick your device. Do all your firmware updates through the apps supplied by OneKey. The Trezor compatibility doesn't stop there. And then we can also use it with Exodus. You know, they both shop in Sparrow, Electrum, MetaMask, and just about anything else Trezor compatible that you can try. I tried a bunch and really was very impressed. The one key thing I will say is that you do need to make sure that the devices are running the latest firmware. The firmware they shipped with uh, wasn't always correctly detected, uh, but once I updated them all the latest firmware, it worked just fine. And if you have tr any trouble getting to the shop, you may also need to install the hardware bridge for your platform. The other thing that's really interesting here is that they have not only open sourced uh, the firmware as well as the hardware that goes on here, but their firmware builds are actually being run through GitHub Actions, meaning that you can actually see nightly builds uh, for their different firmwares. That said, I just want to be really clear and say you really do not want to just be flashing, you know, nightly builds onto your device. You know, they may not update properly, they may not quite work, you know, definitely just stick to official releases. You can actually see a GitHub action that will build a, a particular release of the firmware. And the thing that's really impressive is that you can actually fork it to your own repository and actually build the firmware yourself using GitHub actions. The thing that's really clever about that is you don't actually have to be someone who has the technical skills uh, required to be able to set up your own build environment and to be able to build that software yourself. You can actually quite easily just fork their repository and just have it be built on GitHub servers for you. And what I've actually got here is the classic build that I forked onto my GitHub and I've actually just run that action and we can actually download the firmware that it produced here. And to flash that firmware, we just need to install the uh, bridge and then we can just navigate to firmware.onekey.so. And I'll just quickly note, I'm actually using Firefox here because it didn't actually show up properly with things like Brave and Chrome. It might work for you. And I can actually just select from local file. This is the firmware that I just built and we'll just flash that one there. We're happy that it's gonna get wiped and we'll say install firmware. There we go, so we'll confirm on this device here. All right, install new firmware, yep. There we go, so this is the fingerprint of the firmware that I just made. And if I just scroll down to the bottom of the build classic firmware part of the GitHub Actions, uh, I can actually see that firmware fingerprint that was built just now uh, here. And then we can see that, that matches what is on the device. So I can say continue. There we go, new firmware successfully installed, power off. Now it's actually warning me that I'm running unofficial firmware. This is normal if you have built the firmware yourself. So we'll just say continue. There we go, we can see that's the same fingerprint that was from the firmware that I built. And we'll just say continue. And there we go, so this firmware is now running the software that I just built in the cloud, uh, just using GitHub Actions. Very impressive. 
As I talked about in my previous video for the Blockstream Jade, I think it's one thing to open source your software and your hardware, but to go the extra mile and to actually make uh, using and reproducing that open source software accessible to uh, average users or even users with maybe a bit of a technical background, uh, I think is a fantastic achievement and something really that is an example to uh, everyone else in the space. If that's something you're interested in doing yourself, you could just jump onto uh, my GitHub and actually just see the basic changes that I made to sort of remove the schedule to build to flash uh, a specific release and to remove the notification to their Slack server. And it's the same stuff for the touch. And if you want, you can actually even download the firmware files that I built uh, and that I used in this video. So you can actually click on that workflow for Build Classic and uh, you can download that firmware right there. Though interestingly for the touch, it's actually throwing me an error right now saying that I have an invalid firmware header, uh, but I'll have to look into exactly why that's happening and sort it out later. This is probably also a good sort to mention that if you find yourself in a situation where your device won't start, maybe you've accidentally flashed the Trezor firmware onto it, maybe you accidentally flashed a bad build onto there. Uh, most of the time, as long as you haven't rewritten the boot loader, you should simply be able to wait for the device to go flat, uh, start it up in bootloader mode, and then use the bridge tool to simply reflash the stock firmware. So I've been playing around with these one key devices for a few days now, and I have to say, I'm actually pretty impressed with what they have managed to pull off. And the main reason for that is that the way they have gone about things uh, has allowed them to be at least as open source as a normal Trezor. I'm also really impressed in that they have taken some of the sort of key issues that I think exist for Trezor devices. Namely, that is the lack of a secure element that Trezor devices have. Uh, these devices both use the same sort of secure elements that you would find in a cold card MK4, uh, which allows them to sort of bring together Together, a very simple secure element as well as open source software stack, which is very good. So you don't have to go adding a passphrase, which is fantastic as far as usability goes. And perhaps the biggest Trezor issue that they address is that they can be used with iPhones. Both the One Key Classic and the One Key Touch that I've got here actually work really nicely over Bluetooth with their native app on both Android and iOS. So if you're someone who's been wanting to use the Trezor platform uh, and run open source Trezor software, but have been an iPhone user, you can actually pretty much get that now using a One Key. The other great thing with these devices is once you have updated their firmware, you know, they pretty much just work with anything that a Trezor will work with, which is fantastic in terms of being able to use it with a wide variety of open source software. The documentation they come with is very good. The main drawback with these devices is really how experienced the team making it is. And I suggest you can see that in one of the security vulnerabilities that was actually uncovered in these devices uh, just recently, where basically just due to an oversight, uh, it was possible to perform a key extraction on them. That was probably fixed in a firmware update, but you know, it's still in important reminder that while it's running uh, mostly the same source code that you will find on a Trezor, they haven't been doing this for nearly as long as Trezor have. I've also added both devices onto my Harbor Wallet comparison table on my website. So if you want to see a detailed feature comparison of how they compare to pretty much every other hardware device I've looked at, uh, you can just jump onto my website and check it out. Thanks again for the team at OneKey for sending these devices out. If you think they would be helpful to boost the security of your setup and want to support me in the process, there'll be an affiliate link in the description. Otherwise, if you have any questions about these specific devices or run into any problems with them, I'll definitely just leave a comment. I'll do my best to reply to all of them. Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Hit like if you think that other people would find this video useful and hit subscribe if you'd like to be kept in the loop about future content I make that helps people stay safe in the crypto space and to recover if they get into trouble. If you have any questions about this video or a topic that you'd like me to cover, just leave a reply.